Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, November 20th through the 26th. First and second Peter, rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023. First Peter 3, 13 through 22 and chapters four and five. Outline for first Peter 3 through 13 through 5, 14. When persecution causes the saints to suffer, they are to remember the patient example of Jesus Christ, who suffered and then gained exaltation. Jesus Christ preached the gospel to the dead so that they might receive a fair judgment. Those who are called to minister follow the example of the chief shepherd in caring for the flock of God. The sustaining grace of the Lord comes when we humble ourselves and cast all our cares upon him. Happy are ye who suffer for righteousness' sake. 1 Peter 3.13 And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Ordinarily the saints are not harmed for doing that which is good, but if they are, so be it, and blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 1 Peter 3.14 But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Speaking of worldly people and influences, Isaiah said to the saints in ancient Israel, Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear. And let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary. Then he comes forth with his great messianic prophecy that Israel's Redeemer shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to many among whom he shall minister. By applying Isaiah's counsel to the saints of his day, Peter, among other things, is equating the Lord of hosts with the Lord Jesus. He is directing the Meridian saints to sanctify in their hearts Christ as the Lord. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify, or reverence as holy, the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer or a defense. With meekness and fear, or reverence and awe, to every man that asketh of you a reason for the hope that is in you. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to give an answer to every man, said, The true saints are an informed people. They know the doctrines of salvation and rejoice in the privilege of presenting them to the fathers of their children. Members of the church should be prepared at all times to give their testimony with meekness and fear to every person who asks them. Peter counsels his readers to be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives believers a hope of receiving the promised blessings of righteousness, and Peter reminded his readers that by bearing their testimonies, they would help others learn about this source of hope. In the phrase, be ready always to give an answer, the word answer is translated from the Greek word apologia, which can also be translated as defense. This Greek word is the root of apologetics, a term used to describe the defense of religious beliefs. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that the saints have a responsibility to defend truth. Articulate advocacy is surely needed now to respond to some of the secular sophistry we see and hear in the world. Austin Ferrer warned, Though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Peter said, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. President Russell M. Nelson explained how best to share our religious beliefs with others. Each member can be an example of the believers. Your good works will be evident to others. The light of the Lord can beam from your eyes. With that radiance, you had better prepare for questions. Let your response be warm and joyful, and let your response be relevant to that individual. Remember, he or she is also a child of God, that very God who dearly wants that person to qualify for eternal life and return to him one day. You may be the very one to open the door to his or her salvation and understanding of the doctrine of Christ. 1 Peter 3, 16-17 Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conduct in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing, than the evil-doing. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, If occasion requires, it is better for persecution to come upon you because of your good conduct, than for you to suffer for your sins. 
How can we be ready always to give an answer to those who ask us about our faith? Your family might enjoy role-playing situations in which someone approaches them with a question about the gospel. Christ preached gospel to spirits in prison. Elder Bruce McConkie said Peter patterned his presentation of one of the most glorious of all doctrines, that of salvation for the dead, after the approach used by Isaiah to acclaim the divine sonship of the Lord Jesus. In the midst of a long and somewhat intricate commentary about some warlike intrigue then in progress, Isaiah prophesies that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, using this messianic utterance as a sign of the assured eventuality where the local war and intrigue were concerned. Our interest in the ancient contention is nominal, but the almost incidental proclamation about the future birth of the Son of God is of transcendent worth. Continuing his counsel about local political circumstances and after decrying the course of those in Israel who would make a confederacy with other nations, Isaiah burst forth with his great prophecy that the promised Messiah would be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense in the day of his mortal ministry. And then as he spoke of still other unrelated matters, Israel's messianic seer wove in the fact that when Christ came, the people that walked in darkness should see a great light, and that the child who should be born as Israel's king should be the mighty God, who shall reign on David's throne over an endless and eternal kingdom. And so it has been with a host of the messianic utterances and of other matters of infinite worth. They have been presented in an almost casual and offhand way. And so Peter is here engaged in a persuasive pr presentation of the sufferings endured by the saints at the hands of wicked men. He is counseling the members of the church to bear up under these unjust burdens, and he uses Christ in his suffering as the crowning illustration of enduring the sharp daggers of infamy for righteousness' sake. Then, almost incidentally, he adds that this suffering of the just one resulted in his death and subsequent ministry among departed souls who hearing the gospel in the spirit prison would then be judged on the same basis as is the case with men in the flesh. And what a glorious doctrine this is. There is scarcely another gospel teaching, save our Lord's very atonement itself, to compare with it. To think that, in the mercy and wisdom of God, every living soul shall have a fair and a just opportunity for salvation and exaltation, regardless of the time and circumstances of his probation. The great principles and procedures whereby the saving truths of the gospel are offered to, accepted by, and made binding upon the departed dead comprise the doctrine of salvation for the dead. Pursuant to this doctrine, the principles of salvation are taught in the spirit world, leaving the ordinances thereof to be performed in this life on a vicarious proxy basis. By accepting the gospel in the spirit world, and because the ordinances of salvation and exaltation are performed vicariously in this world, the worthy dead can become heirs of the fullness of the Father's kingdom. Salvation for the dead is the system whereunder those who would have accepted the gospel in this life, had they been permitted to hear it, will have the chance to accept it in the spirit world, and will then be entitled to all the blessings which pass them by immortality. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, that he might bring us to God. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to Christ suffered for sin, said the most severe and intense suffering ever undergone by any person in all eternity was borne by the Son of God in Gethsemane when he took upon himself the sins of all men on conditions of repentance. Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. And referring to the just for the unjust said, The righteous Lord, who was without sin, suffered for us men who are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And referring to that he might bring us to God said, It is only in and through the atonement of Christ that men are and can be brought to God. If there had been no atonement, all men would have remained everlastingly in the grave without temporal redemption, and all men, having been cast out of the presence of God and being in the bondage of sin, would have become angels to a devil, without spiritual redemption. 
and referring to being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, said, The holy Messiah layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit. That is, having inherited the power of mortality, which is the power to die, from a mortal mother, he voluntarily laid down his life, and having inherited the power of immortality, which is the power to live, from an immortal father, he was able to take up his body again in glorious immortality. 1 Peter 3.19 For which cause also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, said, In the realm of departed spirits there are two divisions, paradise, where the spirits of the righteous go to await the day when they shall come forth in the re resurrection of the just, and hell, where the spirits of the wicked go to be buffeted and tormented until that day when they shall come forth in the resurrection of the unjust. Our Lord did not go in person to the spirits in hell, which is the spirit prison, as such. His ministry in the spirit world was among the righteous in paradise, but even these considered their disembodied state as one of bondage. Thus, the designation spirit prison may be said to have two meanings, hell, which is the prison proper, and the whole spirit world, in the sense that all who are therein are restricted and cannot gain a fullness of joy until after their resurrection. In President Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead, the, the Lord revealed this detailed account of what actually transpired when the slain Lord ministered to the spirits in prison. The eyes of my understanding were open, President Smith said, and I saw the hosts of the dead, both small and great, and there were gathered together in one place an innumerable company of the spirits of the just, who had been faithful in the testimony of Jesus while they lived in mortality, and who had offered sacrifice in the similitude of the great sacrifice of the Son of God, and had suffered tribulation in their Redeemer's name. All these had departed the mortal life, firm in the hope of a glorious resurrection, through the grace of God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. I beheld that they were filled with joy and gladness, and were rejoicing together because the day of their deliverance was at hand. They were assembled, waiting the advent of the Son of God into the spirit world, to declare their redemption from the bands of death. Their sleeping dust was to be restored unto its perfect frame, bone to his bone, and the sinews and the flesh upon them, the spirit and the body to be united never again, to be divided, that they might receive a fullness of joy. While this vast multitude waited and conversed, rejoicing in the hour of their deliverance from the chains of death, the Son of God appeared, declaring liberty to the captives who had been faithful, and there he preached to them the everlasting gospel, the doctrine of the resurrection, and the redemption of mankind from the fall and from individual sins on conditions of repentance. But unto the wicked he did not go, and among the ungodly and the unrepented, who had defiled themselves while in the flesh, his voice was not raised, neither did the rebellious, who rejected the testimonies and the warnings of the ancient prophets, behold his presence, nor look upon his face. Where these were, darkness reigned, but among the righteous there was peace, and the saints rejoiced in their redemption, and bowed the knee, and acknowledged the Son of God as their Redeemer and Deliverer from death and the chains of hell. Their countenances shone, and the radiance from the presence of the Lord rested upon them, and they sang praises unto his holy name. I marveled, for I understood that the Savior spent about three years in his ministry among the Jews and those of the house of Israel, endeavoring to teach them the everlasting gospel and call them unto repentance, and yet notwithstanding his mighty works and miracles and proclamation of the truth in great power and authority. There were but few who hearkened to his voice and rejoiced in his presence and received salvation at his hands. But his ministry among those who were dead was limited to the brief time intervening between the crucifixion and his resurrection. And I wondered at the words of Peter, wherein he said that the Son of God preached unto the spirits in prison who sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah and how it was possible for him to preach to those spirits and perform the necessary labor among them in so short a time. And as I wondered, my eyes were opened and my understanding quickened, and I perceived that the Lord went not in person among the wicked and the disobedient who had rejected the truth to teach them. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers, clothed with glory and authority, and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, 
even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead, and the chosen ministers went forth to declare the acceptable day of the Lord, and proclaim liberty to the captives who were bound, even unto all who would repent of their sins and receive the gospel. Thus was the gospel preached to those who had died in their sins without a knowledge of the truth, or in transgression having rejected the prophets. These were taught faith in God, repentance from sin, vicarious baptism for their remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, and all other principles of the gospel that were necessary for them to know in order to qualify themselves that they might be judged according to men in the flesh and live according to God in the spirit. And so it was made known among the dead, both small and great, the unrighteous as well as the faithful, that redemption had been wrought through the sacrifice of the Son of God upon the cross. Thus was it made known that our Redeemer spent his time during his sojourn in the world of spirits, instructing and preparing the faithful spirits of the prophets who had testified of him in the flesh, that they might carry the message of redemption unto all the dead unto whom he could not go personally because of their rebellion and transgression, that they through the administration of his servants might also hear his words. Then President Smith named some of the noble and great ones whom he saw in the great assembly in the spirit world, and said that they and the whole vast assembly waited for their deliverance, for the dead had looked upon the long absence of their spirits from their bodies as a bondage. These the Lord taught and gave them power to come forth, after this resurrection from the dead, to enter into his Father's kingdom, there to be crowned with immortality and eternal life, and continue thenceforth their labors as had been promised by the Lord, and be partakers of all blessings, which were held in reserve for them that loved him. I beheld that the faithful elders of this dispensation, he also said, when they depart from mortal life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel of repentance and redemption, through the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God, among those who are in darkness and under the bondage of sin in the great world of the spirits of the dead. What additional truths did President Smith learn? President Joseph Fielding Smith taught as the work President Joseph Fielding Smith taught of the work that is taking place in the spirit world. In the justice of the Father, he is going to give to every man the privilege of hearing the gospel. Not one soul shall be overlooked or forgotten. This being true, what about the countless thousands who have died and never heard of Christ? Never had an opportunity of repentance and remission of their sins. Never met an elder of the church holding the authority. The Lord has so arranged his plan of redemption that all who have died without this opportunity shall be given it in the spirit world. All those who did not have an opportunity here to receive it, who there repent and receive the gospel shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. The Savior inaugurated this great work when he went and preached to the spirits held in prison that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, or in other words, according to the principles of the gospel, and then live according to God in the spirit through their repentance and acceptance of the mission of Jesus Christ who died for them. Regarding this work in the spirit world, President Lorenzo Snow shared his thoughts. When the gospel is preached to the spirits in prison, the success attending that preaching will be far greater than that attending the preaching of our elders in this life. I believe there will be very few indeed of those spirits who will not gladly receive the gospel when it is carried to them. The circumstances there will be a thousand times more favorable. First Peter 3.20 Some of whom were disobedient in the days of Noah while the long suffering of God waited. While the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Elder Bruce McConkie said, These particular spirits, the spirits of those who lived in Noah's day, were taught the gospel during their mortal probation. Their opportunity to believe and obey the truths of salvation came while they yet dwelt in mortality. Hence, even assuming they accept the truth in the spirit world, the highest inheritance available to them is the terrestrial kingdom. They are forever barred from the eternal life found only in the celestial kingdom of heaven. This limitation on the doctrine of salvation for the dead was revealed to Joseph Smith in the vision of degrees of glory. Speaking of the terrestrial world, the Lord said, These are they who are the spirits of men kept in prison whom the Son visited, and preached the gospel unto them, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, who received not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. 
Thus, there is no such thing as a second chance to gain salvation by accepting the gospel in the spirit world after spurning, declining, or refusing to accept it in this life. It is true that there may be a second chance to hear and accept the gospel, but those who have thus procrastinated their acceptance of the saving truths will not gain salvation in the celestial kingdom of God. Salvation for the dead is the system by means of which those who die without a knowledge of the gospel may gain such knowledge in the spirit world and then following the vicarious performance of the necessary ordinances become heirs of salvation on the same basis as though the gospel truths had been obeyed in mortality. Salvation for the dead is limited expressly to those who do not have opportunity in this life to accept the gospel, but who would have taken the opportunity had it come to them. All who had died without a knowledge of this gospel, the Lord said to the prophet, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. This is the only revealed principle by means of which the laws pertaining to salvation for the dead can be made effective in the lives of any persons. There is no promise in any revelation that those who have a fair and just opportunity in this life to accept the gospel and who do not do it will have another chance in the spirit world to gain salvation. On the contrary, there is the express stipulation that men cannot be saved without accepting the gospel in this life if they were given opportunity to accept it. Now is the time and the day of your salvation, Amulek said, for behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. An application of this law is seen in the words of the resurrected Christ to the Nephites. Therefore, come unto me and be saved. He said in repeating with some variations the Sermon on the Mount he had previously given the Jews, For verily I say unto you, that except ye shall keep my commandments, which I have commanded you at this time, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Thus salvation was forever denied to those Nephites unless they gained it by virtue of their obedience during mortality. On the same basis, there is no such thing as salvation for the dead for the Latter-day Saints, who have been taught the truths of salvation and had a fair and just opportunity to live them. In referring to eight souls were saved by water, he said, they were saved temporarily in that they did not drown with the rest of the inhabitants of the earth. In the days of Noah, the Lord sent a universal flood which completely immersed the whole earth and destroyed all flesh except that preserved on the ark. Noah was born to save seed of everything when the earth was washed of its wickedness by the flood. This flood was the baptism of the earth. Before it occurred, the land was all in one place, a condition that will again prevail during the millennial era. And although Peter is not here alluding to this more important fact, they were saved spiritually in that each of them had been baptized by immersion under the hands of a legal administrator, had received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and been thereafter obedient to the Lord's decree that they build an ark and keep all his commandments. President Spencer W. Kimball said, They were drowned in their sin. Their marriages were for time. They reveled in worldliness. They were possibly like many of the world today who place no curb upon their eating drinking and licentiousness there ignoring the laws of god and the warnings of the prophets continued until the very day when noah and his family entered the ark then it was too late too late what finality in that phrase and last they had a chance in the spirit world to hear the voice of missionaries and prophets again but so late what sad words nearly a further two millennia passed into history and we hear of them again in modern revelation of the vision given to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rignan in 1832, the prophet writes, And again we saw the terrestrial world, and behold, and lo, 
these are they who are of the terrestrial. They who are the spirits of men kept in prison, whom the Son visited and preached the gospel unto them, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, who received not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. Too late, the terrestrial for them. It could have been the celestial, and it could have been exaltation. But they procrastinated the day of their preparation. The same lamentable cry of too late will apply to many of today's church members who do not heed the warnings, but who proceeded, sometimes carelessly, sometimes defiantly, to bind themselves through mortality to those who could not or would not prepare for the blessings which were in reserve for them. 1 Peter 3.21 The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce McConkie said, The temporal salvation that came to Noah's family because they had faith to build and use the ark is a symbol of the spiritual salvation available to all men who through faith are baptized and use the principles of the gospel in their lives. And referring to baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God said, Baptism does not wash away the sins of men unless they have repented. It is not immersion in water alone that saves. It is baptism plus personal righteousness. If those who are baptized are just and true, that is, if they have complied with the law of repentance which qualifies them for the blessings of baptism, then the ordinance so performed will be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise and will remit their sins on earth and in heaven. And referring to by the resurrection of Jesus Christ said, Baptism is efficacious because of the atonement and resurrection of Christ. Without it most transcendent of all things, none of the terms and conditions of the plan of salvation would have any efficacy, virtue, or force, whatever. 1 Peter 3.22 Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, being made subject unto him. 1 Peter 4.1 for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind or intent, idea, or thought. For you who hath suffered in the flesh should cease from sin. In speaking about Christ's suffering, Peter taught his readers that they should arm themselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer as well. When Peter said, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, he was encouraging the saints to think and act the way the Savior did as they faced opposition. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Gain the mind of Christ, thereby thinking what he thought, saying what he said, and doing what he did, which course of life will stand as a defense against the evils of the world. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 Peter 4, 1-2 emphasizes that our suffering should cause us to forsake our sinful lives. 1 Peter 4, 2, that you no longer the rest of your time in the flesh should live to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Elder Bruce McConkie said, even as Christ, the prototype of salvation, suffered for us in the flesh, so should we, following his example, submit to suffering in the cause of righteousness. Those who are faithful when persecuted for righteousness' sake, thereby show they have overcome the lust of men and are walking in the Spirit. 1 Peter 4, 3-5 For the time past of our life may suffice to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When you walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they speak evil of you, thinking it strange, that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick or the living and the dead. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Before we received the gospel, we walked in wickedness, and worldly people think it strange that we no longer consort with them in their evil doings, for which evils, however, they shall give account at the judgment bar. First Peter 4, 6, Because of this is the gospel preached to them who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live in the Spirit according to the will of God. 
The Savior's preaching to the spirits in prison is an example of God's fairness and justice. This doctrine of salvation for the dead makes it possible for all mankind to accept the gospel even though they may never have heard it in mortality. The doctrine of salvation for the dead is unique to Latter-day Saints. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Salvation for the dead is limited expressly to those who do not have the opportunity in this life to accept the gospel, but who would have taken the opportunity had it come to them. Nothing shows forth more perfectly the complete justice, equity, and mercy of God's dealings with men than the doctrine of salvation for the dead. Salvation is not limited to those who are born in a favored lineage. It is not reserved for people who chance to live in a day when there are prophets and apostles on earth who have authority from the Almighty to teach the doctrines and perform the ordinances of salvation. It is not for those only who learn of Christ and his laws in this life. It is available for all men in all ages and in all places. In the infinite wisdom of him who knoweth all things and who seeks the salvation of all his children, it was ordained in the councils of eternity. Before the foundations of this earth were laid, that every living soul, either in mortality or in the spirit world, would have a fair, a just, and an equitable opportunity to believe and obey those laws which lead to eternal life. The Lord be praised. The gospel is preached to the dead so they can be judged justly. One day each person will stand at the judgment bar and give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. How can God judge all people fairly when their opportunities to understand and live the gospel are so different? Notice how the doctrine that Peter taught in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20 and 4, 6 helps answer this question. How do these verses strengthen your faith in God's fairness and justice? President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Why did he, Jesus, preach to these disobedient spirits? Surely not to increase their torments, to taunt them for not accepting of his truth in the days of the prophets. He took the glorious message of the gospel and proclaimed it to the dead with the promise that they, if they would obey it, should partake of its blessings. I joined the church at age 16 because I was young. I thought that genealogy work was not for me. Anyway, I was a new convert, and there were so many other things to learn and do. It was two years after my conversion that I finally saw the light. I was in our young adult Sunday school class when our instructor, Brother Parsons, asked, How many of you love your family? It was such an obvious answer that every hand went up. He continued by asking, Now how many of you have a book of remembrance with at least four generations of genealogical work completed? that is, family group sheets and pedigree charts. Only about three of the 30 young adults raised their hands. Needless to say, I was one of those who did not respond in the affirmative. But what do group sheets have to do with loving your family? I asked. I guess Brother Parsons was waiting for that question because I shall never forget his answer. He said, Bob, your ancestors who died without a knowledge of the gospel are probably being taught the truth right now in the spirit world. Many of them are probably just as anxious to be baptized and receive the blessings of the church as you were two years ago. But without you, they will have to wait. How would you have felt two years ago if your parents had not given their permission for you to be baptized? What would you have said to them had they told you not to bother them about joining the church that maybe someday they'll get around to giving you permission? You are in that same position as far as your ancestors are concerned. They are waiting for you. When I asked the class how many of them loved their families and then asked about the pedigree charts, I was serious. Genealogical research and temple work are works of love. Those who really love their families will do all they can to save them. Those who do for their dead what the dead cannot do for themselves are called saviors on Mount Zion. I left that class with an empty feeling. I was sad that I had not caught the vision of this great program before. I went home and got out a dusty pedigree chart. Where would I begin? I went to my mother and began asking questions. We talked for two hours. I learned things about my family that I had never known before. I soon found my love and concern for my ancestors growing in depths I had never before experienced. Now I know that what President Joseph Fielding Smith said about genealogical and temple work is true. 
Younger people must not get the idea that this is only an old person's work. It is for all the Latter-day Saints and young people can attend to these matters and get the spirit of this work just as much as those who are advanced in years. What can your family do to feel connected to your ancestors? Perhaps you could celebrate deceased ancestors' birthdays by preparing their favorite meals, looking at pictures, or telling stories from their lives. If possible, you could also plan to receive ordinances for your ancestors in the temple. As you think of your specific responsibilities and opportunities in relation to your dead ancestors, what should you do to make the blessings of the gospel available to them? What do you need to do to become a savior on Mount Zion? Speak as an oracle of God. 1 Peter 4, 7 But to you the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Elder Bruce M. McConkie referring to To you the end of all things is at hand said In every dispensation to gain salvation the saints must overcome the world and endure manfully whatever persecution is heaped upon them. And as each faithful saint approaches the day of his departure to the paradise of God it is as though he were prepared for the Lord's second coming. It is as though the end of the world had come in his day. Luke 12, 35 through 48, as marvelously expanded and clarified by the prophet Joseph Smith in the inspired version, sets forth the concept that the Lord comes, in effect, in every watch of the night, so that his saints of all ages must watch and be ready. Referring to be sober, he said, be sober. Cast away your idle thoughts and your ex excess of laughter far from you. Let the solemnities of eternity rest upon your minds. 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity preventeth a multitude of sins. In the King James Version, Peter's words are translated as, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. The Joseph Smith translation modifies this verse to read, and above all things, hath fervent charity among yourselves, for charity preventeth a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 9-10. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Anciently, a hospital was a place for the shelter or entertainment of travelers, strangers, or other guests, and hospitality was the treatment given such persons. Since all that we have comes as a gift from God, and is a manifestation of his hospitality to us. It follows that we are to minister from our means to the needs of our fellow men. Hospitality to each other thus automatically becomes the mark of a true saint and shall ever remain so. Although in our modern society, it is sometimes considered to be more a matter of showing forth the social graces than of providing food, clothing, and shelter to the needy traveler. In the true church, hospitality is one of the characteristics of the members of, and officers, as, for instance, a bishop. 1 Peter 4.11 If any man speak, let him speak as an oracle of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praised in dominion forever and ever. Amen. Elder Bruce and McConkie said, Speak by inspiration, not of yourself, but simply as a medium through whom the mind and will of the Lord is revealed. This is an absolute requisite for a true minister. They must preach by the power of the Spirit. Unless they do so, they cannot minister life and salvation to the children of men. Hence the divine counsel that the Lord's servants are to treasure up in their minds continually the words of life, to rely upon the Spirit, and then without taking thought beforehand to speak forth what the Lord wants him to say in the very moment of their preaching. Saints to be tried in all things. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. The fiery trial probably refers to the Neronian persecutions against the church. Every saint, however, faces his own fiery trial as a part of his experience in the second estate. 
1 Peter 4, 13 and 14. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be re reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Peter encouraged his readers to think it not strange when they are faced with the fiery trial. Peter's advice is relevant to any persecution that Christians suffer in behalf of their beliefs, and he reminded his readers that they ought to rejoice that they are counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how our suffering can bring us closer to God. Suffering is universal. How we react to suffering is individual. Suffering can take us one of two ways. It can be a strengthening and purifying experience combined with faith, or it can be a destructive force in our lives if we do not have the faith in the Lord's atoning sacrifice. The purpose of suffering, however, is to build and strengthen us. Elder Neil A. Maxwell noted the value of trials when he said, Spiritual refinement is not only to make the gross more pure, but to further refine the already fine. 1 Peter 4, 15-16 but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to the fiery trial, which is to try you and suffer as a Christian, said, Mortality itself is a probationary estate, a time of trial and testing for all men. With reference to this eternal plan to send all the pre-existent host of earth, the Lord said, We will prove them herewith, to see if they will do all things, whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. The greatest trials of life are reserved for the saints. They are the ones whom the world hates, and they must overcome the world, if they are to gain the Lord's approval. They face all that the world faces in the way of mortal difficulties, sickness, disease, calamities, famine, pain, sorrow, death, and in addition, their faith in Christ and his works is tested to see if they will serve the Lord at all hazards. I will prove you in all things, the Lord says to his saints, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if ye will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if at first begin at us, what shall the end be for them that obey not the gospel of God? Elder Bruce and McConkie said, When men are slain and destroyed for their sins, let it begin at my sanctuary, saith the Lord. For where there is more light, there is greater condemnation. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation, and as a whirlwind it shall come upon the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. 1 Peter 4.18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Elder Bruce McConkie said, If the fire can scathe a green tree for the glory of God, how easy it will burn up the dry trees to purify the vineyard of corruption. 1 Peter 4.19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Elders to feed the flock of God. 1 Peter 5 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to, who am also an elder, said, An apostle is an elder. And so is every person who holds a Melchizedek priesthood, by classing himself. With this high apostolic calling as an elder, Peter dramatizes the preeminence of the priesthood over the offices of the priesthood, a principle which dignifies the status of all brethren who hold the holy priesthood and raises them, as it were, to apostolic stature. 
President Joseph Fielding Smith said the priesthood is greater than any of its offices. No office adds any power, dignity, or authority to the priesthood. An elder has all the priesthood he needs to qualify for exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were ordained elders on April 6, 1830, thus obtaining the first ordained offices in the church in this dispensation. Peter, James, and John had conferred the Melchizedek priesthood upon them in June 1829, but there were no offices in the priesthood until after the organization of the church. It is not possible to hold an office in an organization that does not exist. Later, other offices came as the needs of the ministry required. Elder Bruce McConkie said ordinations to offices must conform to the law of common consent. Those receiving priesthood offices have the obligation to labor with zeal and energy in their particular callings. It is by magnifying one's calling in the higher priesthood that men obtain exaltation in the eternal worlds. Priesthood offices exist in time and in eternity, and those who magnify their callings in this life will continue on as ministers of Christ holding offices in the priesthood in the realms to come. And referring to a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, said, Peter's calling and election had been made sure. He had already received the promise of eternal life in the Father's kingdom. 1 Peter 5.2 Feed or tend or superintend the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight or overseeing or guarding or watching, therefore not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to feed the flock of God, said the elders, priests, and teachers of this church shall preach the principles of my gospel, which are in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, in the which is the fullness of the gospel. And they shall observe the covenants and church articles to do them, and these shall be their teachings as they shall be directed by the Spirit. 1 Peter 5, 3-4 neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to the chief shepherd, said the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Writing specifically to the elders of the church, Peter taught that those called to lead and direct the saints act as under shepherds who feed the flock of God. Church leaders are to follow the example of Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, in their efforts to care for the flock. Those who do so will receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to a crown of glory, said eternal life. Be ye humble. 1 Peter 5.5 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth, or opposed, or is adverse to, the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, said, The divine plan calls for the young and rising generation to take counsel from their elders, to submit to parental guidance, to conform to the revealed pattern. Rebellion, dissension, and disobedience are antichrist. And referring to humility, he said, All progress in spiritual things is conditioned upon the prior attainment of humility. Pride, conceit, haughtiness, and vainglory are of the world and stand as a bar to the recipient of spiritual gifts. We are commanded to be humble. Always remain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness, and his goodness and long-suffering towards you, unworthy creatures. King Benjamin taught, and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and standing steadfastly in the faith. Humility must accompany repentance to qualify a person for baptism. It is required of all engaged in gospel service as an essential attribute for all who embark in the service of God. Proceeds the acquiring of wisdom from the Spirit is needed to qualify the righteous to see God, and without it no one can gain entrance to the kingdom of God hereafter. Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand, and give thee answer to thy prayers. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 13. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, 
because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in or laid up or endured by your brethren that are in the world but the god of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by christ jesus after that ye have suffered a while make you perfect establish strengthen settle you to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever amen but sylvanus a faithful brother unto you as i suppose i have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of god wherein you stand they at babylon elected together with you saluteth you and so doeth marcus my son Elder Bruce McConkey, referring to Marcus, my son, said probably John Mark, Peter's friend and companion, who wrote the gospel account, which bears his name. First Peter 5.14 Greet you one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen.